You know the tale of the four little rabbits, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and of course Peter. Author Beatrix Potter imagined and illustrated the world of the bunny in the in the blue coat, where he pulled up onions, tried to keep from being baked into a pie. Outside of Mr. McGregor's garden and in her own life, Beatrix Potter had a curious eye for the natural world around her. The idea of Peter Rabbit actually came from sketches and observations of her own pet rabbit, Benjamin Bouncer. She also kept hedgehogs, bats, and frogs, and developed a scientific interest in fungi, mushrooms. My next guest is here to tell us about Beatrix Potter's scientific tales. Linda Lear is author of Beatrix Potter, A Life in Nature, and a contributor on the new book out called The Art of Beatrix Potter. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you, Ira. Happy to be here. Linda, most people don't think of Beatrix Potter outside of rabbits. How how did you come to her other illustrations? I discovered Beatrix Potter when I was in the Science Museum in London and came across these incredible fungi drawings out in the lobby. And in somewhat typical Brit fashion, there were no labels on them. So as I inquired, I found out that they were by Beatrix Potter. I had no idea. Yeah, they're amazing drawings. What what struck you about them the most? Well, they're in beautiful watercolor. They're incredibly detailed. They're scientifically so accurate that now, um, all these years later, most of them were done in the 1890s, and all these years later, scientists still go up to the Armit Museum in Cumbria to look at her drawings to identify fungi. Was, there, was that the same period of time in history where we saw all these great detailed f- uh, drawings of flowers and plants, things like that in nature? The Victorian um, passion for natural history was ubiquitous, um, especially in the uh, upper upper middle classes and upper class. So her father, for example, had a wonderful library of books on nature and all sorts of the sciences. Um, her uncle, uh, Roscoe, was a... Um, a royal fellow and a chemist who invented the Bunsen burner. So she had some science in her background, but uh, it was a passionate thing. Uh, everybody was drawing flowers or drawing bugs or drawing rabbits. Mm-hmm. Now, you've also written a biography of uh, Rachel Carson, who helped start the environmental movement. What is there about both of these women that may be similar or captured your interests? Interesting question. Thank you. Both of them were Victorian rebels. Both of them grew up with um, a lot of restrictions, and both of them sort of dared to break the envelope uh, very cautiously, but nevertheless rebelliously. Yeah, how did Beatrix Potter break the envelope? Well, she was born into a very, very well-to-do Unitarian family in 1866, and she had no. She had a younger brother. She was educated at home, had no, was not allowed no friends. Um, and the family, while they were well-to-do, they were socially ostracized because of their uh, faith in Unitarianism, which was not a popular um, faith at the time, um, although always very scientific. And so she had to devise things to keep her occupied. I think the great nemesis of Victorian women was the, the, the problem of boredom. So Beatrix Potter early on started drawing and loved drawing. And as you said in your beginning, she started drawing the animals in her schoolroom, she and her brother. So this is way before she, she did the, the, the children's book series? Way before. This is almost as an eight, eight, ten-year-old. She was drawing beautifully. She had to take drawing lessons because her parents forced them on her, but she hoped that they would be over soon and that they wouldn't corrupt her own style. She and her brother had quite the collection of pets that were the basis of many of her drawings, right? Yes, it would. I don't think her mother uh, ever came up to the third floor nursery, uh, <laughs> or certainly didn't come very often. Um, and she had some some snakes and some um, unsavory things that I don't think her mother would have approved of. But they drew them, and then when the animals died. Uh, especially the rabbits and the hedgehogs and the things that they really liked to draw, they would boil the skeleton, boil the uh, the skeletons, and then reassociate the bones so that they could be anatomically correct. So if you look at her rabbits, you'll see that she knows every muscle. Talking with uh, Linda Lear, author of Beatrix Potter: A Life in Nature, and also a contributor to the art of Beatrix Potter, sketches, paintings, 
and illustrations. And I, and I want to go to one illustration, one beautiful sketch in the book about the spiders. I mean, I'm looking at an illustration of a jumping spider, and it's very technical. I mean, all the tiny little hairs, the details. How is she able to observe these details and get them so accurate? Well, she hung out a lot at the Natural Science Museum, which was a place that she was allowed to go as a single woman um, and went often and spent hours, uh, got to know the curators and drew um, on site the specimens that they had. And this was one of them. It's a quite remarkable drawing because of the, the, the detail. And this is in watercolor. There's another illustration of fossils and hand tools, which they sound dull, but it's really appeal- appealing how she captures this thing. It's very appealing. The, this is the, um, the advantage she had in travel when um, the family removed from their house in London to go to a country house or to go away so that the clean, spring cleaning could happen. And one, the one of the, of the fossils is, is interesting. I think she almost got interested enough in geology that she could have pursued it. But then again, there was no money in it. And, and, and how could a woman you know, really get anywhere except be an associate, assistant, lower level person at the British Museum? So that didn't appeal. But these fossils are three-dimensional. She's captured the nooks and crannies and the all in watercolor again. Um, they're just they leap off the page. They're just just extraordinary. They are, and you know it's, and when you look at it, because they are three dimensional, um, you, I got the feeling that she wasn't just trying to be an artist here, but she was trying to be a scientist. Absolutely, she she was trying to be a scientist and use her art to f- further the science. She got a commission from the Morley college for men um, to draw uh, specimens of of, uh, bugs, insects, um, for their classes. Then um, this she did very well, and it was a a donation, if you will. She was being a a good upper-class woman by saying that she would give these drawings to the college so that they could have them in their science classes. But she was that good. And then, then we have fungi. Oh yeah, um, which did become a huge passion for her. And first, she, her interest in fungi was uh, imaginary. She loved to watch uh, fungi bloom. Um, she loved their colors. She talked about, made up a rhyme about nid nid naughty lying in a row, and how the wind would blow, and their little leaves and heads would shake. She illustrated um, lots of fungi as a um, fantasy kind of thing. Then she got interested um, because of a Scotsman in Perthshire, where they vacationed in the summer, who was a naturalist. His name was Charles McIntosh, and he was quite a wonderful naturalist. But he only had one hand, and he couldn't, he could, he could do microscopic work, but he could not draw. So they made a deal that he would teach her about fungi and about their various parts of the, of the fungus. And and she would draw the fungus for him and send it to him. Uh, when he sent her live samples, she would send them back to Perth. Yeah. Uh, she has an illustration going back to that mushroom because you brought it up, and it is such a wonderful drawing of a crimson wax cap mushroom. And she shows the details of the underside of the cap, but she also has the grass growing at the base of the mushroom. Right. She put it in, she put it in the ground. And she also showed the underside and the stem. And this was Charles McIntosh. He taught her how to, how to um, dissect the mushroom, how to show its gills, and how to show where it was planted and what the kind of, kind of condition it might grow in. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't just drawing these mushrooms, but actually coming up with scientific ideas about them. Yes, she was. She really was uh, interested in how spores germinate. And she had a, a theory. Turns out it wasn't symbiosis, but it was close. It was part of the theories that were hot during the uh, 1890s, and she that was the subject of the paper that she wrote for the Linnaean Society. Talk a little bit more about the, the, the Linnaean Society of London and how, how her uncle got helped her get in there. Well, it's a story of um, scientific jealousy, actually. Uh, the, the director of Kew Gardens, uh, uh, Sir Thistleton Dyer, if you will, um, had dismissed Beatrix uh, when she got a ticket to do some research at Kew, 
dismissed her theories and dismissed her drawings about how spores might germinate. But one of the other scientists, botanists at, at Kew, took her seriously. And um, some way, uh, and, and her uncle, Sir Henry Roscoe, um, took offense that um, Slistleton Dyer had mistreated his niece and um, been abrupt and surly. And so he encouraged Beatrix to, 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 to write this paper, which she did in all the research in the family kitchen, which turned out, of course, to be a pretty bad place because the drawings got contaminated. But um, she, was, she was encouraged by him to do it, and she was interested enough to see it through. And then this other uh, botanist from Kew actually read the paper at the meeting because she couldn't attend. Wow, I, I, I never heard, I never realized about that about her. I guess most people never thought about that. No, no. And then it's she's she's um, Beatrix Hodder could have been any sort of natural scientist she wanted to be. She was that smart, that dedicated, and that good a scholar. But um, the only the only science that did not entice her was astrology. She said that the stars gave her a tissic, which means a headache. So what was it that stopped her from pursuing that interest? Um, money and sex, I guess I would say. Um, money in the sense that she was after uh, a little money of her own to become independent. And she found that by selling drawings as cards to a very fine printer in London, she could make a little money of her own. And that's how she started illustrating small books or books for children. She sold some drawings in the 1890s and was very proud of herself. Um, sex because um, she was a woman and uh, she did give this incredible paper on the spores of the of a fungi that she was um, researching to the Linnaean Society, but she couldn't attend. Um, no women were allowed. No women were allowed in. No women were members. Um, but she did try to offer a scientific paper. That's quite interesting. Um, how did the idea for Peter Rabbit come about? How did how did that get published? Um, through this card dealer, actually, through her connections with cards. But she drew this letter. Um, the the first letter was a letter to the little boy who was the uh, son of her first governess, her very fond first governess. He was sick in bed, and so she was trying to entertain him. And so she said, "I think I'll tell you the tale of Peter Rabbit." And she drew the letter and sent it off, and he loved it. And she sent more. She, he had several brothers and sisters. She kept sending them letters. She wrote letters to children of all sorts, illustrated letters. Her, her former governess, now friend, knew that Beatrix was trying to get a little money of her own and suggested that she take that letter and, and have it republished, which she did. At first, she was turned down by seven or eight publishers, who um, I think didn't like it mostly because it was not in color. But she drew this little book, and then she decided she'd just publish it herself. So we have self-publishing publishing back back in the 1890s. It did get published. It did get picked up because she agreed to publish it and to redraw it in color And um, after she printed her own copies, and then it went gangbusters. Quite interesting. Talking with Linda Lear, author of Beatrix Potter, A Life in Nature, and a contributor to the art of a Beatrix Potter, on Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Did her views on nature inform the stories of Peter Rabbit or, or any of her other characters, you think? Yes, she, she, um, she didn't believe in evolution at the time. I mean, it was a very new thing. But she knew nature as being very rough and red in tooth and claw. So there are stories, most of her stories um, often have a, an element of danger in them, not just being put in a pie, but, you know, badgers and the foxes and um, raiding houses. She's she's always got something in there that's a little bit dangerous and shows us that nature is unpredictable, that uh, we aren't in charge. Nature is unforgiving. And unforgiving. Huh. So what made her decide to sort of switch careers then? Well, no, she was she was looking always for something useful to do because, you know, women in Victorian times didn't have useful jobs. 
So drawing um, and learning about the natural world was something that Victorians were very excited about. I mean, it's the heyday of natural history. And her father was um, also a, a photographer. Her mother was an artist. Her, father, her brother became an artist. So drawing uh, the, the world around her was what she could do um, to keep from being so bored. And so on vacations and travels with her family to the countryside, which they did do, um, often, she she drew what she saw, and that's how the letters to children also started. After she was done with the illustrations and moved on to the children's books, did she ever talk or think about, hey, maybe I'll revisit doing these illustrations about nature again? No, I don't think she ever did. She was um, By that time, she was very busy being a farmer and a wife and a sheep farmer and growing vegetables and um, thinking about how to finish another book before her eyesight went. <laughs> One last question. Do you think there were other women of the Victorian era who you came across during your research who might have gone into science also? Absolutely, absolutely. And there are, there are lots. The Emma Cons was one, and um, there's a woman who did studied shellfish as another. Um, they were all in the same sort of group of highly uh, industrious, bright, educated women who were terribly bored and had to find something to do. Well, maybe yeah, we can talk you into uh, writing a book about <laughs> maybe another book. Maybe. <laughs> well, we're very we're very happy to have your other books. Linda Lear, author of Beatrix Potter, A Life in Nature, and a contributor on this new book out called The Art of Beatrix Potter. Wonderful illustrations.